Hello and welcome to Tech Tips. Today we will discuss the Jepson approach chart. All Jepson approach plates have the same standard format. We will specifically read the ILS approach chart for Mumbai. We will start with the header of the chart. In the top left corner of the chart, the ICAO code of the airport, V, A, B, B, is printed. This is followed by the three letter IATA code, which is B, O, M, for this airport. The name of the airport is also mentioned here. In the top right corner, the name of the city and the country where the airport is located are printed. Mumbai, India. Followed by the type of approach, which is ILS Zulu approach for runway 27. Some airports have multiple approaches for a single runway. They can be classified as X-ray, Yankee or Zulu. In this case we are discussing the Zulu approach. The center part of the header includes the chart index number, which for ILS approaches always starts with the number 11. The dash 3 indicates this is the third ILS approach at this airfield. There are other runways with ILS approach as well, those charts will be indexed 11-1 and 11-2. An ILS chart always has the identifier 11. Jepson has standardized the classification in such a way that the approach with the highest precision gets the lowest index number. So ILS charts are 11. RNP charts are index 12, VOR approaches are index 13 and NDB approach charts, which are now obsolete, are index 16. This is followed by the chart issue date and the effective date. In some cases, you will not see the effective date. That indicates that the chart became effective the same day that it was issued. In this chart, the chart notification was issued on February 22, 2013 and the chart became legally effective from 7th March. Now, the first row of the chart is for communications. It lists the frequencies and the sequence of their intended use. For example, a pilot on approach into Mumbai, will first tune to the ATIS frequency. The ATIS will provide information like weather and type of approach. Some airports have ATIS information available on the data link. Then, D, ATIS is printed on the chart here. The next frequency that a pilot will need is the approach frequency. The R denotes that a radar is available. Similarly, the tower and ground frequencies are also mentioned in their expected sequence. The next row is for the different navigation frequencies. The first column always denotes the primary navigation frequency for the type of approach. For an ILS approach, it is always the localizer frequency. The ISCZ is the identifier of the localizer and the frequency is 110.3. This is followed by the final approach course of the ILS, which is 271. Every ILS approach needs a mandatory altitude checkpoint on the final approach segment. This is a reference point for the pilot to check that they are on the correct glide slope, and that a false glide slope has not been captured. In this case, the checkpoint is at the locator outer marker, denoted by L, O, M and the corresponding altitude at this point should be 2580 feet. The figure inside the brackets represents the radio altimeter height. Finally, in the next column the airport and runway elevation are mentioned. The last column on the right shows the MSA. MSA is the minimum safe altitude or the minimum sector altitude. This altitude is the lowest altitude that an IFR aircraft can fly at within 25 nautical miles of the reference point, which is Bravo 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 VOR in this case. This minimum altitude ensures obstacle and terrain clearance of 1000 feet in normal terrain and 2000 feet in hilly terrain. So we can see that when approaching from the east, an aircraft can descend down to 2,600 feet within 25 nautical miles of the VOR and be clear of any obstacle or terrain. In the western sector, this altitude is higher. It is 3,700 feet. However there is a special marking here, and denotes that in the western sector within 12 miles of the VOR, the safe altitude is 2,600 feet. In the next row, we see the standard missed approach procedure. If a pilot is unable to land after making an approach, he should follow this standard missed approach procedure, which is climb straight ahead 600 feet, turn left heading 230, continue climbing. When passing 2,600 feet, turn left to the VOR to join the holding at 3,700 feet, or as directed by the ATC. Any Jepson approach plate always mentions the missed approach procedure in three different places. You can see, in the first place it is mentioned here in plain simple text. In the second place, this procedure is drawn here for easy interpretation. Thirdly, the same missed approach procedure is drawn here in shorthand, for quick and easy reference. The next row is for barometric settings. The barometer setting for this approach should be hectopascal. 
Some countries fly on the inches of Mercury setting, however here it is HPA. Next, the runway elevation is given in hectopascal. The transition level will be informed by the ATC and the transition altitude is 4000 feet. The next section of the chart is the plan view of the approach. It shows the basic geography of the location. Here you can see that the airport is located near a coastline area. The thin black lines is the holding at the VOR and the VOR frequency is mentioned here. The bold black lines represent the approach segment. The frequency for the ILS is mentioned here as well. The dashed black line is the missed approach segment, as already discussed. You can see the various sector altitudes that we discussed before. The black arrow always represents the highest obstacle on the chart. In this case, it is at 1516 feet. In the boxes, you can read some important information for this airfield. Like here it cautions you do not mistake another airport with similar runway alignment. And here it informs you that a DME is required for this approach. In this chart, you can also see a prohibited area. Prohibited areas are no-fly areas. Here it is denoted by the identification VAP2. The VA is the code of the FIR, the P stands for prohibited and number 2 is the identification number. Similarly, restricted areas in this same FIR will be identified as VAR and danger areas as VAD. In the next row, you can see a DME and altitude table. This table is to be used only if the glide slope is inoperative and the pilot is performing a localizer only approach. From the table, the pilot should read the altitude at every DME checkpoint and correct the aircraft's vertical position. For example, at 9.1 ILS DME, the correct aircraft altitude should be 2,900 feet. At 8 ILS DME, the correct altitude should be 2,570 feet. And so on, all the way till 1.5 ILS DME and altitude 500 feet. The next part of the approach plate is known as the profile view. While reading the chart, both the plan and the profile view are to be read together to give a complete understanding of the procedure. Here you can see that the aircraft will approach the initial approach fix, the VOR at 3,700 feet. It will leave the VOR on a track of 078 for 12 miles and descend down to 2,900 feet. The aircraft will perform the base turn and intercept the localizer course of 271. At 9.1 ILS DME it will begin to intercept the glide path to begin the final approach segment. It will continue the approach till the missed approach point, which is 1 ILS DME, and if the runway is not in sight, it will then perform a missed approach procedure. Below the profile view, there is a simple table for conversion of ground speed into expected rate of descent on the glide path. For example, you can see that the glide angle is 3 degrees, and on this approach, an aircraft with a ground speed of 140 knots should get a normal rate of descent of 743 feet per minute. If in actual conditions, a pilot achieving any significantly different rate of descents may be on a false glide slope. On the right hand side is, once again a representation of the missed approach procedure, which we have discussed earlier. Also you can see here that the runway has poppy lights installed on the left hand side. The runway is also equipped with high intensity approach lighting system of configuration type 2. The bottom part of the chart is the minima. Here you can see that for a straight landing on the ILS, the CAT-1 minima is DA of 230 feet. In the brackets is the radio altimeter height of 207 feet, which is not used in CAT-1 cases. If performing a localizer-only approach, shown here is glide slope out, the minimum descent altitude is 540 feet. At the bottom you can see the visibility minima for different categories of aircrafts. This chart is to be used for category C and D aircrafts only. For an ILS approach, if the full approach lighting system is available, then a minimum visibility of 800 meters or RVR of 550 meters is required. If the touchdown zone or center line lightings are not operating, then a RVR of 720 meters or visibility of 800 meters is required. If the complete approach landing system is non-operative, the minima will be 1,200 meters. Similarly you can read the minima for a localizer only approach as well. This part of the chart shows the minima for a circle to land procedure. For a category C aircraft performing a circle to land procedure, the MDA will be 1,480 feet and minimum visibility of 5,000 meters is required. For a category D aircraft, the MDA is 1,700 feet and the same visibility of 5 kilometers is required. This particular approach chart is for CAT 1 ILS only. 
you may be aware that there are different minima for CAT 2 and CAT 3. Here is a quick look at different minima for other category of ILS approaches. Let us have a look at the ILS 30 left approach for Dubai. This chart is for CAT 2 and CAT 3 ILS approach 30 left. You can see that the CAT 2 ILS minima is radio altimeter height of 100 feet and the minimum RVR required is 300 meters. For CAT 3A, the DH will be 50 feet RA and RVR of 200 meters. For CAT 3B, the minimum RVR will be 75 meters. Also there is a note here for the missed approach climb gradient. If the climb gradient is below the normal requirement of 2.5%, it is not mentioned on the chart. However, in Dubai 30 left, the minimum climb gradient required for missed approach is 2.8%, that's why it is mentioned here in the chart. That is all the basic information we need to know on the Jepson ILS approach chart. Hopefully we have simplified reading of Jepson charts for you. If you have any questions, please ask us in the comments section below. Do subscribe to our channel for more such videos. See you next time.